All right. Well, welcome. I did we everybody and everybody kind of leaped over. So I feel like we're in a sci fi sometimes when this happens. <laughs> it's very fun. Um, so great. I love seeing those thumbs up there. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us here today. This is uh, an incredible panel and a wonderful opportunity. Um, and again, I am going to jump this right over. I'm going to tell you, first of all, I am coming in live from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, if you know anything about the United States, Arizona is one of the hottest places. And we never have rain. And today is the one day that we have thunderstorms. So my internet has been a little uh, iffy today. So I'm going to make sure I'm going to have everyone just do a self introduction there, and um, and we'll get started, and then I'll start going into some of those questionings with you. So uh, Cher, I'm going to start with you. Hi Kelly, so thank you. Uh, so I'm going to be the one, uh, uh, the first one presenting. Is that it? Okay, I'm going to have you, I just first want everyone to do a round of introductions, oh, sorry, so sorry. just name, <laughs> organization you're with, get you there. And, yeah, uh, and maybe, and maybe you could also share, share just uh, briefly to um, our STEM Leadership Alliance affiliate for the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, I'm Cheryl Monterola. I'm, as Kelly mentioned, I'm from the Philippines. I'm from the University of the Philippines. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, science education, but I also lead the Center for uh, Integrated STEM Education. And we have collaborated a lot with uh, the U.S. STEM Leadership Alliance uh, in terms of uh, organizing the first Integrated STEM Leadership Summit in Asia. And then later on, uh, working with uh, Sebeo Secretariat, Sebeo STEM Ed Center, uh, MIT JWell, and again, Unila Foundation, to put the uh, to put together the second integrated STEM leadership summit, which happened last uh, January 2021. So uh, this is actually my fourth time uh, joining the STEM US STEM Leadership Alliance. I started joining in 2018, and I'm very happy to be here again. Thank you. Um, probably right. I pass it over to um, lights. <laughs> lights. Yes, uh, yes, good evening, good morning to everybody. I'm uh, Lights Filoria, I'm the National Project Coordinator for the Women in STEM Workforce Readiness Development Program here in the Philippines. Uh, I, I, well, this is my first uh, STEM Alliance, but I, uh, STEM Alliance Summit, but I've been joining actually the Integrated STEM Conference here in the Philippines, I think for two, three years now. So happy to meet you all here. Uh, I move the floor to Dr. Sumida. Hello, my name is Manabu Sumida, a professor of science education, College of Education at Hime University. I'm now in charge of uh, Director General of Japan Society for Science Education and the representative for Asia at the International Council for Associations for Science Education. Uh, my area is science education for the gifted and the culture studies in science education. And uh, I'm now in charge of university high school principal now. So uh, it's my great honor to discuss STEM education with you all today. Thank you. So I'm passing to Kessara. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, you are on mute. Yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Kelly, and uh, the organizer for inviting uh, me on behalf of CMO STEMET uh, to uh, this prestigious event. So my name is Gesara Amon Wutiwon. I'm the program director of CMO STEMET. So our center promote uh, evidence-based policy and practices in strengthening STEM education. So my area of expertise is in managing uh, public-private partnership programs, uh, mobilizing their resources in strengthening STEM education, and, and in my view, by engaging multi-sector partners is the way 
that we can reform or change the way that STEM education should be introduced to help students learn uh, better and earn the relevant skills uh, in the dynamic uh, society yeah, for the 21st century. Thank you. I suppose that leaves me the last one, yeah? Uh, a yeah. very good morning. <laughs> very good morning, good evening to you, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very honored to be in this session. Thank you, Sherry, for um, extending the invitation to me. My name is Yong Zubairi. I'm a professor of statistics. I'm also uh, holding a uh, administrative post. I'm the uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for International. So meaning to say that I drive the uh, internationalization policy uh, university-wide. Uh, on a personal note, since my area is on in the field of statistics, I am very much involved in promoting statistics uh, at all levels. Uh, I am the uh, country coordinator in a network uh, where we call the uh, Institute of Statistical Literacy uh, for the country. So during the pandemic, we have turned around the project where we do the uh, project online. Um, also, I am representing the university in trying to find avenues, opportunities for our newly formed STEM center, which is about two years old, to engage with international partners. So once again, I do look forward for this session. Thank you very much. Well, as you can see, we have a very distinguished panel here today. Um, and so I, I would like to start, um, we're just gonna kind of do a round robin here, but I'd like each of you to just begin to kind of share your work um, and we'll spend a couple minutes with that. I've asked for all of the participants as you're listening to about their work, start posting some of those questions there so that we can get to answer them towards uh, after their presentations. So um, Dr. Cher, I will go ahead and start with you. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, allow me to pull up my slides uh, to just illustrate what we have been doing here in the Philippines. Um, I hope you're able to see my slides now? Not yet. How about now? <laughs> Not yet. Ah, there we go. Okay, then. Yay. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm, um, I'm leading the Center for Integrated STEM Education. At the same time, my day job as a professor of science education in the University of the Philippines. Uh, our main um, mission as a Center for Integrated STEM is um, to advance STEM education for nation building. So we're actually a spin-off organization of Unilab Foundation. And um, we have the following uh, activities uh, based on the strategic pillars that we have. One of our strategic pillars is, is teacher upskilling. And since March of last year, we were able to reach 300 20,000 teachers to our different um, online activities, webinars, conferences, workshops, and so on. In fact, we assisted uh, um, the program led by LIGHTS at, in ILO Philippines and uh, were able to um, facilitate their uh, curriculum guide write shop and uh, workshop for trainers on the integration of STEM in technical vocational education and training. So uh, we also collaborated with the university for their uh, edutech innovation workshop. And as mentioned earlier, we uh, collaborated with uh, SEMEO, STEM Ed Center, SEMEO Secretariat, MIT JWell, of course, US STEM Leadership Alliance, and uh, Unilab Foundation uh, to put together the second integrated STEM Leadership Summit in Asia um, last January. Another pillar that we have is uh, on learner empowerment. And um, uh, during the pandemic, we were able to quickly uh, produce what you call um, some sort of psychosocial support for children. So we produce COVID-19 comics. And um, this series of COVID-19 comics was actually uh, circulated by the Philippine Department of Education. So we're estimating that uh, we were able to reach about 12 million students. Also, we produced um, an urban agri booklet and a Filipino storybook on urban agriculture. This is to um, accompany the agri-grow kit distributed by the Philippine Department of Agriculture 
uh, this AgriGrow Kit is actually um, their program on food security, but intended or targeted for young children. And then uh, another work that we did was on um, producing um, kinder to grade two modules, and uh, for which we also assembled uh, sets of lab in a box, uh, so that for those uh, families without resources at home, while they are being cooped up, uh, cooped out because of the pandemic, uh, because of the lockdown, they can still perform experiments together, and also to somehow assist uh, our home learning partners. Uh, we produce video tutorials so that they can enjoy the experiments together with their uh, kids. Um, on teaching innovations, we uh, participated in the production of different um, TV and radio um, uh, pr pr programs. Uh, we were part of the DepEd National TV. Uh, we produced um, episodes for junior high school science then. Uh, we're estimating that we're able to reach about 7.1 million learners through that initiative. And our uh, radio program, uh, we, as of now, when we started, uh, since we started, we uh, were able to have about 1.1 million views, uh, both through the uh, tele, uh, tele radio uh, pro, uh, platform. And then just a few more slides. Uh, we have what you call the Source of Gone Steam Innovation Program. Uh, we were able, uh, a few years ago, I think in 2019, when I was here uh, and, and per, uh, during an, the in-person um, uh, summit, uh, we presented the preliminary um, results of this program. But we were able to complete it uh, uh, last year, and um, we were able to generate 92 community responsive student projects out of out of the program. We did a pre and post uh, evaluation. Uh, just to really uh, have an evidence of the impact or the effectiveness of the program. And we were able to see a positive impact on the following lifelong skills, resilience, growth mindset, work ethics, critical thinking, science process skills, ICT skills, metacognitive awareness, math, math skills, and beat. And also, uh, we were very proud that uh, one of the schools that we that uh, actively participated in the program was actually recognized by the secretary of the Department of Education. Uh, they were actually one of the finalists for the Secretary's Award for Excellence in Curriculum and Instruction. Uh, another strategic pillar that we have in the center uh, we have we established partnerships with government agencies, industries, and uh, and other uh, acad uh, educational institutions, academic institutions. So we supported uh, Semeo Secretariat uh, for their Semeo Congress 2021. We're collaborating with Smithsonian Science Education Center. Uh, we're field testing uh, modules on biodiversity and sustainable communities. Uh, we have an upcoming uh, publication. Um, that's uh, actually commissioned by the Asian Development Bank on uh, a, a, a particular case study on uh, Philippine STEM education. And we're working with the Philippine American um, Academy of Science and Engineering and with another division here in the Philippines um, so that we'll be able to scale up our STEAM innovation program. And uh, there's a potential upcoming or upcoming work with the International Labor Organization on the pilot implementation of STEM in technical vocational education and training. And lastly, um, with UNICEF, uh, we're able to, we will soon start a project on boosting uh, alternative learning systems, learners' uh, growth mindset and employability skills through integrated STEM education. So these are the things that we are doing at the Center uh, for Integrated STEM Education. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to our uh, co to my co-panelist, uh, Dr. Kesara. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cheryl. So uh, let me uh, share uh, my slide here. So uh, I would like to spend the next uh, seven to eight uh, minutes about uh, introducing the center and what uh, what our center's mission are and how they are related to promoting and implementing integrated STEM education. For many of you who might not have known about CMO centers, uh, CMO STEM Ed is part of the uh, 26 regional uh, CMO centers in Southeast Asia. And for our governance, we have the uh, CMO Council who oversee uh, 
the all the senior center governance, which uh, is led by now the um, Minister of Education of uh, Singapore. And for each regional center, uh, we have a governing board represented by uh, each representative from 11 countries. All regional uh, senior uh, centers, they have common uh, missions related to human capacity uh, development, provide technical assistance and consultancies, uh, or create a dialogue for policymakers, or promoting uh, research and development in their respective in their relevant areas and promote the partnerships among the CMO countries of uh, even countries. When CMO summit uh, is established, uh, these are the regional issues that have been uh, voiced that how STEM education can help uh, address these issues. The first one is about student achievement, which is the uh, measured by PISA and uh, as PISA uh, assessed, right, a lot of, there's still a lot of disparity between uh, the disadvantage and advantage kids, uh, especially in the area of critical thinking skills, literacy skills. And the next one is about how each country can use the, the STEM skills in uh, moving, moving away from resource intensive based country to more of the how to sustain and preserve the natural resources or how to use the science technology to add values to product and service so that their citizens can uh, earn a better income so that we can move away from middle income trapped. And the last one, how we can promote the use of evidence in order that the policymakers can mobilize and use the resource more effectively in order to promote the STEM education for, for the young people. For CMO STEM Ed, uh, as I mentioned before, that we position as the regional research and capacity building uh, excellence center of STEM education using evidence-based policy and practices. Uh, we have these five strategies in order to achieve the two goals, uh, which promoting STEM education for K-12 uh, learners and also how to help build the skills that prepare young people for the STEM workforce. And these are five areas, but I will not go into each area. The, the second one that uh, I would like to focus more, and the fourth one is about capacity building for educators. The second one is how we can promote public-private academy partnerships in order that uh, student can or learners can build or develop their skills. And we... Uh, we have studied that career academies have been uh, proven in the U.S. and we plan to adopt them in Thailand and in the, uh, in the region. The way that we adopt the programs, for example, in terms of the left side, professional academies, building capacity of educational uh, personnel, uh, using the professional learning communities and how to strengthen the smallest unit of schools, uh, which is uh, the school to improve or manage uh, better in uh, delivering STEM education, or how to build uh, capacity of uh, education sector through innovative learning resources. And lastly, how we can introduce a new model of uh, education that help enhance the skills that prepare young people for the same workforce. To be able to uh, implement uh, these strategies, we need to build the capacity of researchers, practitioners, and policymakers in order that uh, they can be able to uh, use the evidence uh, and uh, use the effective program more uh, wisely. This is 
uh, a kind of model when we promote STEM education, we don't look at uh, only individual teachers, individual leaders, but we work with partners like universities and help build their capacity of delivering a better STEM education because we believe that that is a more sustainable model. So we work closely with this partner and try to provide technical assistance. And uh, we try to let them introduce the new way, new approach from the pre-service program to in-service program so that the teachers can be able to adopt new practices in order that uh, those new practice can lead to higher student outcome. The next one, which is, I think is very uh, important uh, model. We've learned that in the US uh, STEM career academies uh, and CTE career technical education has been proven that it lead to uh, lower dropping out rate of students and also leading to higher income of students. Uh, that means um, students are highly motivated through this model. And these are the key components that we are now piloting the career academies in Thailand. And there will be more countries who will try to adopt these career academy models. So uh, the, the process that we used in promoting a new model like career academies uh, is that we advocate to policymakers about the model and we engage the partnerships from both academia, uh, schools, and also a private sector because we believe that if the new model is introduced, it should be uh, driven by the demand sides, the employers who need the skills uh, that they look for from the students and they should be taking part actively in introducing the or informing the schools that what kind of skill sets that they look forward to and their expertise in certain industry area will help uh, reform the way that uh, current the uh, basic education uh, is delivering to students and learning resource and expertise should be mobilized, especially in this the COVID era. We learned that they can work together and sharing a lot of resources that might be developed by uh, one entity and can be shared virtually with others. And we believe that the key uh, success factor is capacity building. During this, the the pandemic era, we should try to build capacity of educators and get prepared yeah, so that uh, after the COVID situation relaxed, they are more ready to implement effective programs. And this is the slide that I would like to emphasize that the center look for the implement, implementing sustainability model that if we see any model that is effective, we raise awareness of that model and we build capacity of educators to implement such models. We, and we believe that when we adopt new models from elsewhere, we should be able to try them out and adopt and maybe adjust. And then we study the effectiveness of the adjusted model. And then we present the finding to the policymakers that uh, what we think should be the recommendations to policymakers. And then we scale them up by securing funding from either government and private sector, sector who would like to see the scaling up of effective programs. And we believe that in this way, the use of evidence can be promoted and sustain the culture of evidence-based policy and practices. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my session. Thank you. So uh, that is my presentation. And uh, I, I would like to uh, pass the, the baton to the, how about to Dr. 
Uh, Dr. Elinat, please. <laughs> You're on mute right now. <laughs> oh, there you go. All right. Can you see my screen? Uh, it's it's blank right now, but yep, there we go. There you go. All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so good evening and good morning to everybody. Um, I think I'm going to build up to what uh, Simeo here has just shared. You no, know, on. On, on the work that we are doing, not only on research on STEM, integrating STEM, but also of um, the policy initiatives. So um, I am from the Women in STEM Workforce Readiness Program of the International Labor Organization. Uh, and this is supported by JP Morgan Foundation. And we are in three countries. We are in Thailand, Indonesia, and in the Philippines. But it is in the Philippines that we concentrated. We started first as con uh, concentrating on education initiatives to uh, get more women into STEM-related sectors. But this is in the Philippines was where we concentrated on uh, integrating STEM in the VET curriculum. So let me just share. Uh, we have three uh, target outputs for this program. Um, we started off for our first year on just convincing women to uh, those who enrolled in vocational trainings, vocational school trainings, into STEM-related uh, occupations. And we started off with partnering with uh, the Tibet uh, um, government, so uh, government here, which is CESA, uh, uh, first on trying to convince you know, women to get into STEM-related trainings first because our studies would show that um, women are not uh, that motivated to get into the STEM-related trainings. And we, we, we try to improve that by um, improving the existing communication channels, focusing on um, how we can convince more women, um, including how we market these trainings to promote career and education opportunities on STEM. Um, this would later follow. So after we were able to establish that in the in TESDA, uh, what we discovered was that it was not just enough that we convince women to get into the STEM related trainings, right? Um, we also have to show them, right, that if you do take these STEM related trainings, you would be able to transition to work in these STEM related occupations, and that involved. Um, not just promotions, right, but also working with the different agencies concerned on these educational opportunities. And uh, we created a government technical working group that is focused on STEM for workforce readiness, um, which, which is designed to actually um, uh, put together all the efforts that are related to promoting the STEM occupations, um, and this is uh, this is composed of different departments in the in government. We have the Department of Education, Commission in Higher Ed, Department of um, ICT. So we have, um, I think, at least uh, eight uh, government agencies. Just you know, bringing together all these initiatives that they're working on towards creating that call to action on STEM because we are recognizing that this is not the work of one agency alone, but it is a collaboration of different agencies working together to share information, to, to also um, integrate all these actions that they need. Um, the third output that we focus on was how do we remove those barriers you know, for both men and women to enroll and then graduate you know, um, for STEM-related occupations. So number one, we institutionalize scholarships for women in STEM-related TVET trainings. Because if, uh, if a woman sees that uh, she has these opportunities there, you know, she, she's actually more convinced to invest, you know, in her training and education in these trainings. Um, second was we also wanted to strengthen. No? It's not enough that we just promote uh, career opportunities. We also need to strengthen uh, the curriculum in terms of strengthening STEM competencies for workforce readiness. We recognize 
um, especially in the ILO, that in preparation for the future of work, we need to we, we need to prepare them with the requisite skills for them to be able to get the jobs for the future. And that includes strengthening these competencies in existing curriculum, in particularly in technical vocational education. And we did this with TESDA, and we focused on four things, you know. Uh, when you are integrating STEM into curriculum, um, I think the first thing that has to be designed is the framework. And we've been working with Dr. Cheryl on this um, for the STEM for Tibet framework. Like, what does, what does STEM competencies look like? How do you integrate that? And how does that, you know, how does that meld into the curriculum? And so we designed first um, the STEM for Tibet framework, which you can see here on the slide, which is divided um, into four, right? The STEM knowledge, the thinking skills, the multiliteracies, and social emotional intelligence. And all these um, have to work together for, for us to be able to design a STEM and Tibet uh, framework, which includes employability, proactive citizenship, and human flourishing. After that, we created learning materials. Now that you have the framework, we have to show proof of concept and we created the student work of a trainer's guide and assessment tools. Um, then after which we, we also developed the professional development of trainers. Um, I think Cheryl shared that a while ago. We're in, we had to show our trainers, right? That this is how STEM and Tibet looks like. And it's amazing how when they saw this, they realized, hey, there's always been STEM in my work, you know? It wasn't just defined that way, but there's always been STEM not just for the knowledge, but also for the thinking skills. Um, and then for this year, you know, we're focusing on the pilot training for that to show like, okay, now that we've integrated, we've identified the STEM competencies, this is how we are in using learning activities to be able to trigger the learning for these competencies. And that's happening uh, this year uh, for web development, animation, game art, agriculture, and also um, this is happening both for TESDA and also the Department of Education. So these are just, so we have trained, I think, at least, you know, 100, you know, 200 trainers um, for STEM and TVET. And to add to that, we, we are working with um, the U.S. State Department uh, for the English for STEM MOOC camp. We're in the Coursera course on English for STEM. Um, has been introduced also to our Tibet trainers to even strengthen these capacities that they have. So um, we don't just stop with just giving them the STEM and Tibet learnings, but we're also adding up to that, like how do you communicate that as trainers? So, yeah, and uh, we're very helpful for this year uh, that uh, we can even continue and scale up, you know, as uh, Simeo has identified. And these are just some of our students who have gone through this program. So we've graduated already more than 300 women from this program. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing more from the panel on this. Um, I think now I pass the baton to Dr. Sunida of, yes. Did I get, did I get our, no, <laughs> our, our, yes, that, yeah, Dr. Sunida? Okay, thank you. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, so shall I start? I want to. Uh, introduce some of uh, Japanese culture and uh, my uh, case studies about uh, STEM education today. The so first, I'd like to say Japan is a kind of STEM education country. A Japanese word, kagaku gijutsu. This is uh, quite a unique word. It's uh, it means science and technology, but uh, it's not equivalent. Because kagaku gijutsu is a one word that blends science and technology. So, for example, Ehime University, my university, and Kyoto University, the number of students in Faculty of Science is 1,000. And the Faculty of Engineering, the number of students is more than two times. 
So Kyoto University、uh, boost of the largest number of Japanese scientists、uh, who have won the Nobel Prize in science. Even the Kyoto University, the number of students in Faculty of Engineering is more than three times. Oh, so not science and technology, but science and technology education. That is quite interesting. And、uh, again. Japanese word, Kagaku Gijutsu is a word, one word that blends science and technology. Do you know him? He is a professor, a doctor, Akira Yoshino. He's a research fellow of Asahi Kase Corporation Japan. So he developed、uh, lithium ion batteries and Won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2019. He's a research fellow of the company. So I would say it's a time to share wisdom and insights and strengths and cooperation among industry, academia, and government to create a new human centered society. Following on, the, on from the hunting society, agrarian society, industrial society, and the information society, the Japanese government is now proposing the fifth stage as Society 5.0. That will be an imagination society or creativity or a smart society in which a combination of the digital transformation and the imagination. Or, and creativity of diverse people will make it possible to solve the problem、uh, facing society and create new values. So, Japanese cabinet just issued the fifth,、uh, sixth science and technology innovation basic plan last March in 2021. It、uh, Show、uh, the statement includes that promoting STEAM education, ARs, art or arts education from compulsory education, so from, from primary education in the society 5.0 era. So you may know that Japanese, Japan had super science high schools. That uh, designated uh, uh, in 2002.、Uh, but uh, it's a very unique political background. The Ministry of Education at that time has a mission to improve secondary education. And another political section, Science and Technology Agency, has To be a best to train science and technological personnel. So, the super science high school program was a good example of the removal of the barrier between educational policy and science and technology policy. That's very unique.、Uh, this figure、uh, shows the number of super science high schools by prefecture in 2020. Initially,、uh, consisting of 26 designated high schools in 2002, the Super Science High School project has since expanded to comprise、uh, 217. And、uh, Super Science High Schools exist in all 47 prefectures in Japan. Okay. As mentioned, Japan's Super Science High School project started in 2002. However, only two high schools retained their Super、uh, Science High School designation as of 2021, and namely Ritsumeikan High School, private high school in Kyoto Prefecture, and Matsuyama Minami High School, a public high school in Ehime Prefecture. My prefecture.、Uh, Matsuyama Minami High School is pursuing the research theme, including STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics education. 
So utilizing the close high school university collaboration, so my university, Ehime University, and the Matsuyama Minami High School collaboration is very famous and popular. And uh, uh, the high school has proactively introduced data science as a school specific class and uh, engaging in STEM, STEM education with a partner school abroad and collaborating with companies. So they went to get, get the data at the supermarket and uh, make the analysis and propose some the improvement funded by the companies. They also are using some IoT equipments to measure and simulate the earthquakes expected in the area. And uh, they made a research of allergy. And uh, this is very unique, uh, connecting female students in super science high schools online and provide uh, some career education for uh, female scientists. And this is a, a STEM contest uh, with high schools in uh, different countries. And uh, uh, this is uh, online mentoring. Uh, she is an uh, alumni of the high school and uh, now the professor of Ehime University. Oh. Again, Japanese people like branding. So STEM, I, uh, I would show, uh, oh, let me check. STEM plus SDGs, Sustainable Developmental Goals. So for example, in this activity, this is my university kindergarten. In the story relay activities, children, uh, this is a project about water. So children use uh, pictures to link two images and make up their own stories about the drop of waters, how clean it is. And thinking up an original story is also active that uh, enables creative ex expression. And uh, let's make colored water activities uh, by using natural uh, leaves, car, flowers, and stems. And uh, let's make a river activity. This is, uh, of course, engineering, designing a uh, uh, natural water purifier. That's a very uh, interesting. And uh, I want to introduce these activities. Let's make a river activity. Compared to other countries, many kindergartens in Japan have large sand pits on their playground. These sand pits are a great for learning the mechanism and behavior of water flow in the river. In the area where this kindergarten is located, a river has flooded many times with heavy rain damage in its history. The Shigenobu River gets its name from the achievement of uh, Mr. Adachi Shigenobu, the individual who repaired the river. A very rare instance of naming a river after a person in Japan. So children naturally become interested in the local history of the river and the advances made from, through engineering in addition, bearing the amount of water helped the children to imagine natural disasters and the effect and uh, think of ways to prevent the water shortage and flowing. This is another one. Uh, my research, STEAM, but A as agriculture. So children can conduct the germination experiment using sprout seeds from radish. They design their original experiment and the children can visit the plant factory and uh, there is a possibility that children can develop their own plant factory using pet bottles. All right. So again, Japanese people like the branding and uh, Japanese culture is close to pluralism rather than dualism. So I think the STEM is not uh, the plus, science plus technology, but uh, 
science multiply, technology multiply, engineering multiply, arts multiply, mathematics, something like that. Such a good brand, I hope, such a good brand makes children's learning and society fruitful. Thank you. Okay, uh, who do we have left there? Yes. Uh, I think it's, 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 you're, it's certainly yes. last but not least. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my slide, right. So um, I'm going to present something that is very different from the rest of the presenters. Just a glimpse of the, uh, the a STEM education in Malaysia as a whole. Uh, well, this is because, as I mentioned earlier on, this STEM center at the university that we, that I'm attached to at the University of Malaya is fairly new, about two years. Yes, we have done quite a number of initiatives reaching out to uh, undergraduates, reaching out to communities and to about 60 schools that we mentored on in STEM. So my presentation will just give you some information on the background of the STEM education in Malaysia. Just want to share with you the next one, the profile of STEM at school and then STEM at higher education and the challenges that we felt uh, looking at the state of the STEM as a whole spectrum and some of our initiative to move forwards towards that. Malaysia as a country, well, gained independence uh, for more over than 60 years and STEM is actually the, the strategic uh, uh, area that the Ministry of Education do take care of. In fact, in the 80s, in the 70s, quite a number of students are sent abroad uh, to get uh, education in STEM. Like people like me, I was sent abroad to do my master's undergraduate in uh, mathematics and science to go back and get the, um, the uh, training at home to become teachers. So in the year 2000 onwards, there has been a number of initiatives, policies at the uh, national wide where uh, certain waves looking at the, uh, uh, from laying the foundation, the awareness of all the, uh, the, um, uh, the ecosystem involving teachers, students, and community, and so forth. Yeah? So, uh, we in, in fact, the government has rolled some a blueprint and, uh, that is uh, in 2015 up to the year 2025. So this is the one that, that we use as the guiding principle when we have the um, STEM Center at the University of Malaya. So... Just let me share with you the snapshot of the profile of STEM education at schools itself. Yeah? Now, the government hoped to reach a target of 60% of students when they finish high school would be in the fields of STEM. However, the trend from the year 2012, 2019, to even 2020 is going downhill. So it's not meeting the target. Another one is that if we look at the performance of uh, students with regard to gender, so the result shows that a lot of the time girls outperform the uh, boys in science as well as in mathematics. In fact, uh, a survey in 2018 shows that girls are more prone to STEM career as opposed to the uh, boys. I also would like to share the benchmark of the level of STEM uh, achievement uh, in teams, for example, for grade eight in 2019. The math nationally scoring 30, which is really below the international uh, average of 42. Likewise, science really below the average of, of uh, international average of 47 at 37. So really in a nutshell, the challenge is low interest among boys, disproportionate interest between the two genders, poor performance. And then there has been quite a number of research done where the teaching methods really was really the old school where emphasis, great emphasis on theory, concepts, and a very minimal practical um, training as well as even using the uh, living labs and so forth. Now, let me take you to the next level 
um, at higher education. I was involved in a study last year where we look at the data, five-year data from 2015 to 2019 nationwide graduates, right? So when we look at the nationwide graduates, the participation of graduates, the number of graduates in STEM is about 47%, less than 50% are in the fields of STEM. Looking at the gender, we have slightly more females as opposed to males. So if we go deep dive into the fields of study in STEM, 46% are in the fields of engineering related and a very small percent in the fields of agriculture, agriculture and veterinary. Then we also look at the percentage of those working. So we take the subset of students are uh, graduated in the fields of STEM and what is the uh, employability status within the six months upon graduation, we can see over the five-year period, well, the percentage is increasing, but uh, I, I've got a strong feeling with 2020, 2021, the percentage will, will actually be negatively impacted. So that is the profile of participation of graduates in STEM over the five-year period. So in a nutshell, if we we kind of formulate that really the lack of interest in STEM is really out there. This is shown by the poor performance if we benchmark against the international level. And also, if we look at the graduates, uh, the percentage of employability, it's, it's really low. And if we further go deep dive, STEM graduates in the field of fundamental science has got the lowest uh, percentage of employability. We also look at some of the data that suggests that clearly there is a lack of training among STEM teachers. Although they graduate in the fields of uh, fundamental science and then further on to have the pedagogy in teaching, but beyond that, the number of training that they, that they have is, is really very minimal. What we know is that there has, as a country, there is a strong demand for graduates in STEM, especially in fields, jobs that, that need the, uh, in the fields of science and technology. So with the gradual drop uh, in STEM, so that actually will impact negatively on the economic growth. So for us at the STEM Center or at University Malaya, the way we see it to move forward is looking at three broad areas. Number one is to train STEM teachers. What we felt is that there is, there need to be a robust framework looking at skills, the set of skills that, that is really severely lacking, even to reskill some of them. And, and most importantly, in the last year, we've, we learned uh, where you know the we need to leverage on digitalization, be innovative in a in the pedagogy, the the delivery as well as the assessment, because the way um, students decide to use STEM or non STEM is very much based on their performance examination. So really, examination performance examination is the only marker that they use. So we thought that there has to be an alternative assessment to, to get students to be involved in STEM. And then over the two-year period when we set up our STEM center, we worked with uh, several industries, with NGO, government industry. And when we reflect back what we have done, we felt that the ecosystem does not really support. We were doing everything, but we, we haven't really put our effort together to have an impact on the work that we do. So what we, what we have done is really look at what uh, some of the things that we do did well and some of the things that we need to improve. What is very clear is that we have to maintain the network and we'll start to reach out to partners at, a, at an international level. By the end of the day, we felt that whatever initiative that we do, we will be guided by the blueprint um, from the ministry. And we felt that there has to be an extra work to, add, to, to address the, the way it is being delivered 
especially technology proficiency is really one of the core life skills that must be uh, taken into account. So pretty much that's very, that is what I would like to share with you. Thank you so much. Terrific. Uh, just bear with me here. We'll get us. There we are. We're all back there. Uh, I want to thank all of you. It, it's first of all, it's just remarkable to hear. And and I've heard many of you present even during the pandemic. But it's just it, it's it is incredible. And there's been a, several questions. So I want to um, start to go through those because we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, so I'm just going to kind of break it up and just have uh, I'm not going to have all of you answer the questions. I'll kind of just ask maybe a couple of you to um, answer a few. Um, and so we can just kind of get to all of them. I want to kind of start with one of them that's a little bit basic there, but um, just about the culture of STEM. And I really appreciate how you have discussed all of this because as I said, this is very inspiring. Um, but in terms of STEM, and, and I think, um, Dr. Zubari, you mentioned this just about kind of raising that um, interest in STEM. But is it consider kids, like, do they want to pursue these careers? Or is there a lack of understanding um, of what the possibility of this is? And I know we've had a lot of conversation, too. I want to just clarify for our U.S. folks, when we talk about STEAM in Asian countries, that A is for agriculture. And so um, so I just would, I'd love for you to just talk maybe a little bit about, uh, maybe just a couple of you to um, address that question, because I have a couple other questions I have coming up too. Right, shall I answer the question just now? Yes, right. Well, like I said, uh, the way students choose uh, the package, we have the uh, students need to choose the subject packages and the way it is being determined based on the examination uh, performance. And a lot of the time, female tends to do better, so they end up taking STEM, really not knowing what it is all about. But but that's that's where we realize that the the training of the teachers, the way it is being delivered, makes it so unattractive to students. So we try this at the university level, in which we have several programs, students are STEM ambassadors, and the ambassadors are actually the non-undergraduate, uh, the non-science. We have students from a um, performing arts in languages to become students ambassador and we have modules to make them aware of that so and it works very well whereby uh, in the process we meant we get pair them with a mentor students from the engineering for them to look at the real life problems so we use the university as a living lab so we have issues, for example, okay, let's look at the cafeteria. How much food is, you know, wastage there? And that's, that's where they start to think, okay, so what do we do with, that's where we come up with projects on compost. And then we got projects on water warriors, whereby we get people from the faculty of, students from the faculty of economics, working together, students from the faculty of science. So we felt that it works at undergraduate level. But then at that point in time, if it, it's really late in time for us to, you know, inject the interest in STEM. So we had to go back and start very early on. We have projects like going to mommy's lab where we experimented with the local um, communities to, to get our staff to bring in their uh, children to come in to see what does it mean to have your mother as a, as a researcher, as a science professor and things like that. So we felt that it worked. So now what we need to be looking at really have a, a complete framework. I think as what Cheryl and uh, uh, Lina has shared, you guys have done wonderful. You got a very solid fun uh, framework to work on. What we did in the last year was pockets of initiatives. And then last year, what we did, you know, that's where we reflect and say, how can we make this thing better? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, I, there's, um, 
Uh, it, was there another comment from anyone there? Because I had, yes, go ahead, Dr. Samita. Uh, I want to introduce two examples. One is about the effect of super science high school. Uh, the experience of super science high school give the great impact on students and especially girls, female students uh, who go to the uh, science courses at the university is almost three times uh, comparing to the female students in regular schools. That is one uh, uh, example. And another one is uh, university is uh, encouraging the uh, interdisciplinary research unit. For example, my university has a research unit uh, that consists of professor from of agriculture, the professor of medicine, and professor of science and technology, something like that. So uh, the agriculture is a kind of the of science, uh, STEM education, and uh, that's the kind of new interdisciplinary research field is emerging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another question here, and I just I know we're really tight on time, but so in one there in other countries, one of the issues is changing that models of teaching um, in in the teaching of teachers, um, especially when we're talking about the masses, and we have to change that mindset. So how do we do that? Um, and if we could just be very brief, and I, I'm actually going to make sure that everyone has your contact information because I think there's a, there's a lot of questions that are generating from this. So how do we change the masses in teaching? We'd like to start with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, yeah, I can. So I, I think that, uh, mm, I think teacher needs to be able to, uh, to, to learn, to unlearn and relearn, right? Yeah, because they, they have been trained in the tra traditional approach, right? So, uh, yeah, so we, we have to let them be the students who can uh, experience that how inquiry-based learning, active learning is, and let them realize that this is the learning process that the student can benefit. And then uh, through the adopting of the new practices, they need to gain confidence because this is a new approach. So they need mentorship and they need to uh, see the model of the success and be inspired by the success of students. So, yeah, I'd like to go briefly as that. And the, the instructional support yeah, has to be there. Yeah. Thank you. I would also like to add... Um, the importance of community of practice. So after being immersed in, you know, uh, the new, uh, like uh, different approaches for STEM, uh, then it's uh, time to actually network with other uh, teachers who also are interested in upskilling and reskilling and learning and relearning. And so you build that a strong community of practice and then be able to influence other uh, teachers mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to add to what Sharon just said. Um, from the community of practice, we also have to integrate the, the peer learning method, right? Like from this community of teachers, how are we learning from each other? The different practices of teaching STEM. Uh, in particular, how are we contextualizing it, right? So um, from our experience on training Tibet trainers, it's really about, you know, uh, make, bringing to life STEM from a teacher's perspective. Yeah. We, we even came to the point of making them do selfie videos explaining where is STEM in my, in my training course, you know, so that they can, you know, even, even to the point, like make a TikTok video explaining what is STEM so that you can explain that to your students. I think it's, it's integrating the new technologies and at the same time, what is STEM in everyday life so that they themselves can be uh, advocates, and even champions, right? Not just from their course, but also to STEM education. Yeah. Well, wonderful. I, again, it's, uh, it's just a complete honor to have all of you participate in this. It's incredible work that you're doing. I want to encourage, there's some booths. Um, please take a look at the booths. I am going to put into the chat room 
uh, the emails as well. Um, and I just have to go back and I need to add, um, uh, share, I just need to add yours into there. Um, but I'll also add that into the next session as well, because I know we're tight on time here. So again, on behalf of the STEM Leadership Alliance, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, all of you, save the date for 2022. We're all going to be back in person. Positive thoughts there um, in Orlando, Florida, because we would love to host you and just uh, be able to continue to share this work globally. All right. Thank you and have a great evening to all of you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank everyone. you Kelly. Bye. Bye. Thank you.